This peer, I'm hosting the office hours again um, for commercial open source, anywhere from fundraising to uh, code related questions and how to build a uh, hopefully successful commercial open source company. Um, we typically just open up a round of introductions and your most burning questions. So, um, Jacob, if you want to go first, I think you were, or Zach, you joined first. Sorry, Zach, let's get start with you. <laughs> Sure. Um, so yeah, uh, I'm Zach. We're building Daba. So it's a, it's an app for. Uh, so it's in the dev tool space to help software developers uh, set up and deploy their, their projects. And so uh, we're deciding to do it uh, in office, so not remote. Uh, but at the same time, running an open source project, you're gonna have some uh, remote contributions from people uh, contributing to the repo. So I was curious, um, how would you structure communication? with your own team. So should you go like everything uh, as if you were remote so that it's uh, it's like seamless with the, with PR reviews and so on? Or do you have like the, the duality of how you communicate with your team versus how you communicate with the, the rest of the contributors? I can't Can hear. You the last five seconds. Yeah, so I was curious, like, um, should you should you just have one communication, one way to communicate with your team and with contributors or should you is it better like to, since your team is in-house, to have like a better communication since you can't talk face-to-face -face and like uh, structure the, the other way? I'm always, I'm always interested in in-person open source companies because like your community is always kind of like an extension of your team. So um, it definitely works. I find it um, more native to be fully remote and, and distributed because that way all the information you build up as a team is easily being you know, written down and shared with, with others. Um, as long as you can like keep your community, co community involved, like your contributors, um, if you have a public handbook and good processes written out and um, you know, you're engaged in GitHub, um, we have a private, you know, Slack and, and campsite. Um, it's like a, I guess, uh, comms for, for our own team. So we, we also have internal communications um but we we do try to you know be as active as we can on, on on github and discord um so i don't think that's a major concern um it's it's definitely something i find easier to hire remote as a commercial open source company because you end up having a lot of contributors that are not in your area right so that will be you're, you're basically losing out of one of them largest perks of, of building a team uh, in the open source space. So that's something I would be cautious of. Yeah, yeah I was worried about that one too. Uh, the, the thing is like, I tried remote uh, and to be fully transparent, I worked worse when I was remote than when I was uh, in office, but maybe that's just that's just me. I have to, to try to see. I think it really depends on the company, right? Um, I think there are amazing uh, remote companies, there are horrible remote companies, and the same is true for office companies. Um, where, where are you based um, by any chance? Uh, right now I'm in Dubai, but a uh, mm -hmm. few months we're going to have like our main office in France, so in Europe. Okay, okay. Yeah, I mean, French, for, uh, <laughs> French. Uh, France is a great open source hub. Uh, there's many great open source companies coming out of France, if not the most from any European country, so I, I don't think it's... Uh, I think you will have a, a good community locally and you only need like 10 to 20 people to get going. And, and beyond that stage, most companies have a hybrid slash remote company hub anyway. I mean, I don't know at what point companies grow out their office, but typically that's when they become a little bit more relaxed on their in-office in policies. So, hey, Zach. Hey, Omar. Thank you for joining. Um, so I don't know if that was helpful, but uh, I mean, I've always seen the community and the contributors as an extension of our team. So we wanted to also be remote as, as they are, right? Yeah, yeah. That's what I was, I was thinking. Like, it's better to have one way to communicate with everyone so that like, it's uh, even if we decide to go remote, like it, we don't have to change anything. Yeah, yeah. Um, are you still considering going remote or off the same office or? Uh, Right now we're remote just because we didn't like go to the same place yet. Uh, I'm not liking it a lot. Uh, maybe I'm just bad at managing a remote team. Uh, we're gonna try the not remote way uh, for a couple of months and uh, we, we see then. How many people are you? Uh, we're just three now. Three? And yeah. you're struggling with three people to work remote? 
<laughs> yeah. I mean, ideally, I mean, you I, don't have to manage if you are just three people, right? Like. Yeah, but like the it's it's also harder with three people because the the flux of communication is very like uh, frequent. Uh, it's basically a co-founder and an employee. So, for example, mm -hmm. if you have like ten employees, you're not gonna talk all day with one one of them. But with just one employee, it's like you need to communicate all the time. And with the video communication, and so on, it's it's a bit more difficult. Well, I mean, you can just um, what are you first of what are you using? Because like, there's no way you should be in Zoom calls. Like, we barely have any Zoom calls at all, like ever. Like we. We have a couple of stand ups here and there, but like we don't just like randomly DM people and be like, hey, let's jump on a call. I think that's if you translate the office culture to remote, that's where it clearly doesn't work. So yeah. you have to become better at like async comms and writing things down, giving direction, and then trusting your team members to do the right thing. Like a micromanager would try to be on a call nonstop, but someone who has a good direction and then trust the team to, to get there is a little bit like less um, synced up, right? You, you just do a, a daily or even weekly check-in with someone, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's definitely one of the issues. Is the, when you're remote and you have a lot of frequent calls, it, it, it definitely passes up as, a, as micromanaging. So even yeah, if I just should, want to, you yeah. should not have any. I mean, at this stage with three people, I don't think we've had any calls to be honest. Like you just text people, like you write out. Just if let's say this engineer, this employee is an engineer, you yeah. should most definitely come up with a spec of a feature or bug fix, right? Like that's one thing you need to do anyway. And ideally, you say, "Hey, today's Monday. Like, can you get this done by next Monday?" <laughs> and then you don't talk to that person anymore. Like if if, yeah. if the spec if the spec needs constant chatting and stuff, then you failed as someone who who's supposed to write a spec, right? Yeah, so, I think you nailed, um, the, you nailed the issue there. Is we we're not really like uh, we don't know hundred percent what we're building, so there's mm -hmm. like a lot of brainstorming also involved. So yeah, with with like a precise spec, I think that uh, that would be much easier. Then what are you building right now? Um, so the main idea we want to. The main thing we want to solve is that you have a lot of people who learn to learn to code, but it, when you learn to code, it doesn't like uh, help you build software. You still have a lot of things to do, mm -hmm. and uh, those things are where a lot of people like stop uh, stop the process. And so we just want to have like a, an app, something like Replit, but on your computer that can set up your software locally and also help you with the deployment very easily. Mm -hmm. And so yeah, that's that's a huge problem space, and we're still like trying to find exactly what like small thing we we want to work on first we're trying like a bunch of different experiments uh hence the <laughs> the multiple calls nice that makes sense um well i mean at this stage again you, you you probably i don't know if you've launched on github but like don't focus too much on what you have built yet um yeah. like it's it's not really you know uh, i mean eventually your community will come how can i i need to figure out how i can get this on the right Sorry about this. Um, nope. I don't think this is going to work. Anyway, I'm trying to get the chat in here, but <laughs> it seems to not have worked. Uh, yeah, no, I mean, whatever floats the boat, right? Like uh, get, getting together uh, in person is, is magic, especially at that size. Um, and you can still, you know, say, okay, let's get to, you know, early signs of product market fit, maybe launch on product hunt and then before you hire 10, 15 people in France and they're all sitting in the same office, you can still make that decision. So that just yeah. gives you all the optionality. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that totally makes sense. And 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 whatever, like when you think, and I, I like the reason, I like this question because you said like, what's best for the community? You should look backwards and be like, what's best for me to find product market fit? Because like, the, you will not have a community if you don't build something people like to mm. use or like to engage with, right? Like. It's the wrong way of thinking. You need to think of like, okay, what's the what's the really, really best thing I can build? And it doesn't matter if it's remote or an office or if you're like writing code on Mars or the moon. It's you really need to find that first thing first. And then, you know, community building, etc. It's just it's just a tip of the iceberg, really. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Uh, uh Jacob, you wanna go next? Sure. So uh hello everybody. First I just want to say thank you for doing this, Pierre. I know this is something that doesn't happen very often and I'm very grateful. So just a bit about me, uh, I'm, my name is Jacob, obviously. I'm a college student 
I'm a senior, going to be graduating this May, uh, and I'm building Ziggy. It's a tool for like feedback in a dynamic way, as opposed to kind of what's like, static and out there already. Uh, and my question to you, Pierre, is uh, why did you choose to like build Cal open source? Like, what what was like the big reasoning behind doing all this like, open source stuff? Yeah, <clears throat> very interesting. Um, as most of my projects, but also other people's projects. Um, I mostly try to fix my own problems. Um, and I, I do recommend anyone to work on something similar because it's, if you're the first, if you're the first customer of your own product, you, you will, yeah. you know, probably be the best customer of your own product mm -hmm. and, um, do not chase any trend just because someone else is fundraising or having crazy success with something. So like, when I built my previous business that was called leanhire.com, which is a marketplace to hire remote workers or contractors as an, and turn them into employees, mm. the, um, the underlying infrastructure was actually Calendly. So it, during that onboarding, we would ask people to like, please submit your Calendly link. And as you may imagine, not everyone has a link or they forgot to pay or they copied the wrong one or they had a typo or they renamed their account, but they didn't update the the username. So tons and tons of issues um, that we as a marketplace would like would not be able to like fix easily. Mm. Um, and the second thing is I really didn't want to build all of the time zone and calendar APIs and scheduling and email logic myself. I, I want to help people find a job, not like struggle with time zones, right? Um, and as, an, as a developer, I think everyone knows how, how fucking hard time zones are. Mm -hmm. And and so my honest reaction was like, I need something that I can host, I can control and I can like ch like change, like white label or, or brand. Mm -hmm. And uh, to me, that's just open source, right? Um, yeah. And so when I went to Google, I looked for Calendly open source and I was just very surprised that there was no one there doing that. Um, there's an open source alternative or successor to pretty much every type of tech, intercom or whatever. And um, I only found a couple of Reddit posts and, and hacker news threads of people pretty much in the same space as me, not hiring marketplaces, but maybe telehealth or whatever, mm -hmm. to be asking the same question like, hey, what can I use if I want to you know, do X? And I think during that weekend, I just started a, a simple website with a wait list and outlining the, um, the vision of this project. And I started a GitHub project and started like building a very, very simple prototype. And um, yeah, that's how it all started really. Uh, didn't really plan to incorporate it, but eventually that um, GitHub repo and the launch, launch on GitHub uh, was a lot more uh, interesting than my, my previous business. Okay, and uh, what was kind of like the point where you're like, oh, this is actually a business as opposed to just like a project that I'm working on? Um, well, hitting product of the day, week and month was most certainly a, a pretty visible sign that people liked this. Uh -huh. And then uh, also just the um, the inbound that we got from like larger corporations uh, was pretty early on uh, had a really, really uh, strong enterprise pipeline and started selling, making revenue very early on. Um, I was, uh, yeah, I was, it was pretty overwhelming uh, to be honest. I think um, before we had a commercial offering, we already had people paying for it like upfront because they were like really desperate to you know, kind of get in there. That's a really good sign if you make money before you, you have your commercial products actually launched. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, yeah, it's been fun. That's very cool. And uh, so obviously, like how, I guess, what was like the way that you kind of went about getting customers? Was it just like, oh, yeah, here's like our launch on like product hunt and like people just like naturally came? Or is there anything else that you did do that you were like, yeah, this is something I did? Because like we recently launched on Hacker News and we saw like a really like a lot of growth, which is really nice. And it's like, what else like strategies would you recommend? Yeah, well, I mean, it's an ongoing thing, right? Like you, 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 A, you can launch many, many times and we've launched probably like seven times now on Product Hunt and the eighth one is coming on Monday, which you need to tune in, by the way, everyone. Yeah. Um, but so, so building a muscle of just building cool things and being very vocal about it, I, I think that's has been always the, the greatest part. People, people are, and I, I can just 
talk about my own Twitter, like I don't think I've had like a thousand followers before. I mean, I had a few followers, but um, people really just like to follow interesting people and interesting people build interesting things. Yeah. Um, and so if you want to build a more personal brand and, and you know, use that as a funnel to, you know, um, talk about your product, that's great. But also um, just, uh, I, I, I hate to say this, but like, if you build a good product, people will tell, like, talk to others. Like, yeah. if I find a new app on my iPhone and it's freaking awesome, I'm going to show it to my girlfriend and she's going to show it to her friends. And, uh, you know, um, I, I don't like this, uh, this meme on Twitter where it's like um, people building a good product and then they, the, the startup goes out of business because they never did marketing. Like, but they never explained what marketing is. Uh, right? Like you, you, we all know these tweets of like, oh, founder forget to do marketing. No, I think there's a lot more startups that actually only do marketing and have a crappy product. And you can really, ha you have a really hard time selling a crappy product that doesn't help you. Like, um, I, I hate to break it, but like, I've never seen a Tesla ad and still it's probably the nicest electric car on the market. I mean, there's probably a couple new ones coming out, but, um, so I, I think it's really important to not think about marketing too much in the beginning because you really, and this is also the YC mantra, it's like you right. really want to make a hundred people incredibly happy, like get a crowd of a hundred people. And that's not a lot, like one Reddit post could be a hundred people or one, two posts on, on product hunt could be a hundred people and you get them into your discord and you, you, you get them to pay potentially and they pay you, I don't know, 15 bucks a month to be early the subscriber. And if you've nailed all of these customers and, and they are still with you after two months, uh, like two cohorts is probably enough to see if your product is sticky enough. Yeah. Um, then you can go out and, and like think about, okay, what's my go to market and who do I need to hire and how do I need to build a team? But like, I think founders thinking about marketing too early and then like, oh, I need to run Google ads. So I need to go channel partner. So I need to have a successful Twitter before selling a product. Like, I think that's, that's crap. I think that's bullshit. You want to really want to find a good niche with a good product, with an amazing product actually. Um, mm -hmm. And, and, and then try to um, build on top of that because um, the, the, the strongest marketing muscle is still up to this day is word of mouth. And yeah. um, if you can build, for example, we've built a very viral product because in order to use our product, you need to send the link to someone. Mm -hmm. And that's also true for, um, for Loom, where you record a video and you send the Loom video to someone. And I've always been a fan of these types of products because it's like you use the product by sharing the product. Uh, like very few products have that inherent virality in there. But I also think there are ways to have a non-viral product and sprinkle in some of these things where multiplayer suddenly becomes more interesting. Um, I think Figma is another example. It's, uh, yes, you send someone a Figma file, but it's not very common, but yet it's so powerful to invite someone else into your Figma file, right? Yeah. And so um, those types of things where like Adobe has been a single player product for 20 years before Figma came or maybe Sketch, but I, I don't know, but like at least someone came and said, okay, let's have two courses, right? Yeah. So um, I think if you can really think about from a product point of view, how can I get this into um, like N plus one people instead of just like one person, mm -hmm. uh, that's always a great, that's always a great idea. And that's marketing too, you know, building a good product that grows is also marketing. Mm -hmm. Yeah some great points thank you for that and uh i guess yeah that was all the kind of questions i had i'm a i'm a super ba super base user i don't know i like them <laughs> some, something going on I'm, I'm excited to see what's going on <laughs> <laughs> boo we don't do super base here we only do cal base our new database that's launching on monday okay, is that is that the uh, that's what's uh, being yeah. announced we're, we're launching a uh postgres uh database alternative Okay. Even more, even more open source. Uh, yes, open source. yes. <laughs> Sounds good. And and free hosting, like oh, for okay. everyone. You never pay a dime. It's also hosted on a distributed blockchain, uh, which me makes read and write incredibly fast as well, right? This um, is AI tool, right? And it's it's all the database is optimized by AI. So basically, what it does is it compares your string, and then it tries to find someone else's database and like reference that one instead. It's kind of like. <laughs> 
it's a lot faster, right? It's, it's like edge, edge AI kind of. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so I'm excited to use that then. Very excited. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Uh, cool. Do you want to go next, AK? Sure thing, yeah. Um, so again, yeah, thanks for making the time for, for all of us. And so uh, AK from Rollout, you can check us out, uh, rollout.com. We are a open source, recently open source actually, uh, Zapier embedded alternative. And so somebody yourself uh, wanted to basically build a whole bunch of self-serve integrations, um, ended up finding that Zapier was not a great idea where you have to like send people off platform and uh, couldn't find a react based um, version where you, know, you just embed a bunch of react components and you have kind of all the nice drop downs and self serve capabilities so we ended up building up um we funnily enough did not go open source uh from the get-go we have been primarily closed source until about last week wow. and uh well, that's ended up, well i mean it was really just uh to save our ourselves from becoming uh, a custom dev shop because what we realized is uh you know, once we cross like about 100,000 connected accounts, um, the number of long tail issues that our team was just having to solve was just insane. And uh, this ended up just being like an escape pack for us to say, hey, look, we get it. You know, these are all issues that are important to our customers, but we can't solve everything um, at the time that they want. And so open sources are kind of escape hatch to giving them a little more control and flexibility over fixing some of their own issues. Uh, right. But I think like for me now, it's like, all right, look, we, we're kind of now, we, we've done open source. Um, we haven't really spent a lot of time marketing it primarily because in the last you know week, uh, my goal has just been to work with some of our uh, existing customers and how do I get them, how do I figure out the experience for them to you know, self-host, run this locally on their machines, fix issues, contribute back. And so I'm just spending a lot of time getting that experience right before we go ahead and tell other people. But I really just want to, maximize contributions now that we have gone up open source outside of our customer base as well eventually and so first question to you pair uh, how do you like what would you do if you're in my shoes where you want to maximize contributions how do you use you know find the right people who might be interested in this how do you basically make the experience fantastic for them and incentivize or you know encourage them to you know contribute back Whew, that's a lot of questions. Um, <clears throat> I think um, so. Come again, Zapier, open source, embedded. That's already that's a lot. So it's more a is it more like a low code or just like because Zapier is very no codey. Right? The audience is very non engineering. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, well, run me through. And open source is more engineering focused. So, like, who's your yeah. customer? And yeah, right, right. So, um, the when people think of Zapier, they think of the end users who go onto Zapier and connect their applications. Right. Um, we think of Zapier embedded as a product for partners. So, you know, I think Cal has a Zapier integration. So, you guys built that out. Um, and whenever one of your users wants to use it, they kind of have to go out to a third party, you know, Zapier's website, you know, set up all their integrations there, manage it there, and then, um, you know, pay them if you kind of need to pay anyone, right? And so what we basically do is we provide a embedded, fully white labeled, fully customizable version. Uh, you just drop in a bunch of React components and it gives you the ability to say, you know, connect my application to Salesforce, HubSpot, any other tool really that's within our current category list. And, and so and but th those are custom build integrations from your, your team, right? Yeah, yeah, we built them all. Okay. Um well I mean there's a couple ways you could play this, right? There, I've seen at least two unified API startups pop up that are also open source. We so, don't do unified APIs for what it's worth. That is a very different problem set. No, what I'm saying is, but they, no. but you can probably use their APIs to just get a bunch of integrations up and running. No. Um, so our big value proposition is it's self-serve. So we give you the nice UI to say, not only do I want to connect Salesforce, these are all the custom fields, map my own uh, map data. Let's say from Cal, right? If you basically said, okay, this is the data I send whenever there's a new uh, event created. 
um, map all that data within a UI component without building any of that. You just drop in one React component and it just works. Okay. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and, and you need contributors to do what? To build more integrations or? Um, so my goal would be, yes, help improve our existing catalog of integrations as well as fixing uh, long tail bugs that you know, either they or others are running into. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's, a, it's a classic ecosystem chicken and egg problem where, you know, people don't want to contribute to a, an empty ecosystem and, and but to get, you know, interesting community members, you, you kind of have to have an interesting ecosystem in the beginning. Um, I think, it, uh, I mean, the tough, the tough part is you will probably have to build most of it yourself and your team. That's typically how this goes. Uh, you need to be yeah. your first supplier on this quote unquote marketplace. Yeah. Um, and then, um, I mean, as I said quite, quite earlier, and it sucks to repeat myself, but like a good product attracts good people and they are happy to integrate. Um, maybe there is a, a way for you to go a more um, agency route, because I feel like this is something that also kind of like is close enough to like SMB, small startups, um, where you want to work with like agencies that sell to a lot more companies. So you have kind of like these small channel partners. Um, I'm not saying it's, a, it's an amazing strategy long term, but um, maybe in the beginning you get someone, for example, there's a, um, a basement studio, which is the ones that made our website and, and, and they often work with like new frameworks. They work with Next.js when, when Next.js was really new um, and they could either contribute back to your product, but also they can make sure that it gets them to the hand of, of their customers, right? Mm -hmm. um, with open source, um, open source does attract agencies because it's it's a, it's great for their business. Like WordPress has been a, a, a de facto standard for a lot of web agencies. And so I think in that way, you can um, also work with their customers and maybe one of their customers says, hey, we need a whatever, um, Twilio integration or Sencrit, uh, and you don't have that, but then the agency can ship that as a like paid contract to that yeah. customer, but they contribute actually back to your repo, right? Yeah. Um, so, so basically the customer's paying for it because they need it. You get a validation, okay, this integration is actually needed because most people just want something, but they never pay for it or they just, they say they want it, but it turns yeah. out they actually don't. And so if you find someone, you know, if you find the customer paying for it um, and the agency makes money, um, the only thing the agency has to do is to, you know, um, contribute it back to your repo. And I think that's a really good, um, you know, symbiosis for a, for a ecosystem. Mm, mm, I like that, I like that. Yeah. What's the business model and pricing like? Is there any enterprise plan? Uh, Ayuan is, is asking from Algora, by the way, uh, is this, Question for for AK, ideally, right? I imagine. I guess so. Let's get it to AK. Let's What's, go ahead and assume that. Uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> it, it's it's a hosted. Uh, it's been primarily a hosted product until now. We haven't really mm -hmm. changed anything on that. Uh, yeah, so you start off on so they have more of a usage with like a base minimum plan, uh, which starts like 100 bucks a month. Um, mm -hmm. Our pro plan, which is what most folks will use, is like 2K a month. And then there's like an enterprise plan, um, which is custom based on whatever you need. Right, right. And and you want to be open source because of like, first of all, are you fully open source or just the integrations or like what's the spiel here? So um, the only thing that isn't open source is our hosting. Uh, infrastructure and all that mm -hmm. right so but um, i could take your code base run it myself yeah. get all your code yeah yeah, the, yeah yeah there are a couple of uh, companies um out there who who try to you know use the open source as a marketing spiel and yes their integrations are public but you can never run the core code base that uses those integrations and i i find that rather um also when it comes to contributions like a lot of contributors like sniff out the BS of a lot of projects as well. So yeah, um, yeah. Great. cool. Um, any did you had a, another question besides the um, the, the go to market? Um, yeah, I mean, I mean, I, so this is primarily just curiosity, like how you guys manage it, because um, I have 
I was in like the Cal Slack before you guys moved to Discord a while back. That's a long time. Uh, ago, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. But we've been using it, uh, you know, across the years. And so um, I saw you being super active in there um, all the time. I'm wondering how you manage your time, given you're always like, you know, talking to folks within, I'm assuming now it's like Discord, uh, as well as do they see your tweets all the time? Like, how, how do you like, you know, run your day oh, no. <laughs> while doing <laughs> Like while well, doing like you know other work on top of that. Yeah, when do I shower? Good question. Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, I think it's it's interesting. I think um, yeah. How do I find time to? Uh, by the way, I'm also level thirty three on Helldivers. So if you want to play with me, uh, go check out my my Helldivers league. Uh, I think it's just it's just brute forcing. I also try to sleep eight to nine hours a day. I, pretty much hit that every night. So I'm, I don't advocate for cutting out on sleep. It's not worth it. Um, I think it's, uh, I'm not as active anymore on Slack than, like I'm not as active on Discord anymore than I was in Slack, mostly because the community's like grown up and it's pretty large. And if I get notified, if I have my notifications on on Discord, I literally die. Um, so I, I, I wish I was available more for the community, but Twitter, yeah. I mean, Twitter is it's like just lots of toilet time, I guess. So like best tweets always have a lot of bathroom toilet. breaks. <laughs> a lot of bathroom breaks, yeah. Going for a walk, uh, um, thinking about something and then coming back and tweeting it. Um, yeah, I think it's a lot of um, combining things. Like, right. for example, going for a walk with a call right like you, you have a meeting and you ask them like hey can we take this on a non-video phone call do you mind if i have the background noise or like have noise cancelling headphones and you just go for a walk and you go um i don't know maybe you walk 20 minutes to a grocery store uh because you plan your groceries to do anyway right so um i think it's just a lot of combining things or uh, um like non-company calls like catching up with my whatever best friend or so i do while playing hell divers so it's like um, I think you can combine a lot of things and that gives you twice as much time. Um, I do have long days. Like I started like nine and I ended up probably midnight. So uh, mostly because I do like the, the morning for like the Indian Asia team. And then I have a big break in the middle um, because typically at like four or 5 p.m. Germans stop working like I, or Europeans stop working. So that's pretty hilarious. And then between like five to eight or so, uh, there's a big break. So that's where like uh, I do all my chores and, and uh, non-work stuff. And then pretty much like nine to midnight is another good time window for like San Francisco and Bay Area. Um, so just um, use cal.com, you know, have a good calendar, um, have good blocks. I mean, I kid you not, I, I have blocks for like eating and gym and so that you like, I can never be booked there. Uh, I can actually share my screen. This is probably interesting. Um, where is my? So uh, this looks, you know, going for a walk, dentist, gym, office hours, and it's really just, um, yeah, finding focus time in between, right? Um, and focus time in the morning. I don't like taking calls early, so I, I have a big block of. Uh, this is, by the way, this is 10 a.m. This is 11 a.m. So. Uh, I, I don't do a lot of calls before 12 actually because that way I, I can just like get my day yeah. going and focus on like catching up on emails from the last day and like writing some code and then and then eventually uh, yeah meet up with the my co-founder is in New York right now so technically it's his first call but mine is like during the day and then there's a bigger break um, yeah that's mostly how my calendar cool. looks right now yeah. so I do recommend time not time boxing, but just like have a good routine where you just like, yeah, figure out where you can get most of your work done uh, and then fill in the rest. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, cool. And then I actually had one last question if that's all right with you guys. Um, so you guys have an interesting model, which is you have both Cal, the Cal, like Cal on the alternative that you know, users will use, and then you have the infrastructure. Never really understood, you know, like which is your focus because it seems like both are always kind of like front and center for you. Um, maybe, maybe more recently with some of the AI stuff, uh, the app. Uh, yeah, it's. It, I think it's a very timely question because we're we're actually launching an entire new infrastructure product on Monday. Um, 
So uh, do not vote for a super base vote for us. It's it's a lot more interesting. And the 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 reason is um, so as I said earlier with Lean Hire, uh, I I really wanted to build an infrastructure product. And funny enough, the headline hasn't changed since then, like uh, scheduling infrastructure. And we then took a bit of a detour because we realized to build a good brand and to build a good um, infrastructure product, you need trust and you need uh, a somewhat of a user base to understand like what you need to build, but also like whether it works. And so now we went, we started with infrastructure. We then launched a completely different consumer facing product. We bought Cal.com as a domain, by the way. So like that was also not part of the initial launch. And we took this huge detour and we talked about this, me and my co-founder, like a lot. It's like, is this the right place? Is this the right path? Um, because it took us away from infrastructure. And so now after over 2 million bookings and 100,000 users, we're like, we really know what we're building, uh, like what we're building works. Um, the components work, the infrastructure works, the uh, booking infrastructure works. Yeah. Um, but also we have so many people using the product now that you end up talking to a head of engineering who is using Cal.com for over a year now, who, who's looking for, for sketching infrastructure for their telehealth marketplace. So yeah. it sounds like, um, it sounds like a made up, like go to markets, like strategy where people are like, oh yeah, yeah we, we do this. But it, I, to me, it's actually working quite quite nicely um, and if it's not the head of engineering it's maybe someone else from that company at least someone has experienced the, the product um, mm -hmm. and it's a good sell also if you talk to someone's like um, like you, you have great reputation from the consumer side and you say well all of the infrastructure we provide you is the same as the consumers are using every day right so mm -hmm. um, yeah. Me and Jack, Joseph Jack from OSS Capital kind of coined this AppFra. It's like app and infra is like a new kind of like category. And I think there's a really a lot of interesting companies, mostly open source companies, because it's very like obvious for open source to mm -hmm. build a really, really good app and then eventually sell the infrastructure or maybe sell it immediately. But um, I think another example is <laughs> not open source anymore open ai which has a fantastic you know chat gpt when they launched um, i mean there's probably better chatbots now but or chat, chat interfaces but if they had never launched this consumer facing product they would have probably never gotten this much you know attention and users yeah. and stuff and then they eventually ended up selling the api right um, yeah. and and i think the api makes probably a lot more money than the consumer facing product i, I mean the consumer facing product is expensive but but yeah so I'm clear. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I think that's a great example of like app plus infra. Um, and you can make these, you can make many examples, right? Like let's pretend uh, WhatsApp launches a chat infrastructure to build your own, you know, high performance chat interface. Could be. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Probably not a great idea for Facebook because they're not really an infrastructure company, but uh, there's probably some good, good examples as well. Right. And so why do you charge for the app? Because if you're primarily trying to monetize the infrastructure, doesn't it like take your focus away where you're like, okay, I got to like grow this from a revenue perspective, or is it just, is it some other rationale behind it? We, we don't charge for individuals, right? So that's a big difference already to the market. Everyone else in the industry, literally everyone else charges for a pro plan for individuals. Mm -hmm. So you have the traditional freemium, premium, or whatever, prosumer it's called. I've never been a big fan. I think the most viral products are very, very good free products, and you monetize whatever end of the market is. Um, mm -hmm. We are charging teams uh, mostly because the, the difference between charging them and not charging is, is very tiny, uh, mostly because if, if you acquire a business, um, they have the budget anyway. Like if they like your product, they will pay for it. Uh, and so it, we don't really think that we would have like more businesses today using Cal.com if it was free. And there may, there might even be a, uh, a, a negative reputation if everything's free, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, like why is it bad? Does it not work? You know, mm -hmm. um, I, th I had this in the last office hours. It's more about, um, like if you if you see a lemonade stand in the streets and it's like free lemonade, you probably imagine that they pissed in it. Um, and so yeah. 
I think you really want to also represent a high premium good product, even though you give a lot of it away for free for like individuals or, or open source. Mm -hmm. Interesting, interesting. Yeah. And then the for us, I mean, yeah, we do make uh, probably by now the majority of revenue from from infrastructure. Those are self hosters or, or really integrated products um, today. So it's been an interesting, um, interesting kind of like detour coming back to it now. Cool, very cool. Yeah, that's all I got. <laughs> I think about this um, Ephra topic also when it comes to go to market. Uh, if you if you sell a, a pure API that does something, right? If you acquire a single customer, it, it doesn't net you another customer. So that's the topic I talked about, the, the virality product. Mm -hmm. When you have a, a small, even if it's free or maybe it's cheap product that has a, but has a consumer facing angle. Now acquiring one customer may acquire another one. And so I think if you want to build a, a API developer business, which probably you're trying to build, um, think about like, what can I build where acquiring one customer will get me another one? Because it's, if not, you need to get really, really good at door-to-door -door sales. Like if you want to make a hundred million dollars with a dev tool, you need a really, really good sales team that can just go to every country uh, co company and like sell the shit out of your product. Um, you cannot lay back and do like a product that growth and wait for like one head of engineering from one company, talk to another head of engineering at another company. Like that's not going to work. Um, and so uh, I think that's the biggest um, mistake a lot of API or developer products do. They try to sell to developers, but developers are not always decision makers and they also have terrible customers. <laughs> Sorry to be like that. I'm including myself. Like I'm, if I had to pay for React, like I would probably burn Facebook down. And <laughs> I have the money to pay for React. I just wouldn't. <laughs> and so, um, yeah, d selling to developers is, is definitely an interesting um, challenge. But uh, so, yeah, I think that's the most interesting thing to like go for a more consumer facing approach, maybe in the beginning and then, but still keep, you know, the infrastructure really, really present in your mind. That's very cool. Very cool. So I guess, would you say like the for the app infra, like the app is a nice kind of like I guess way to showcase the use cases of the infrastructure, like underlying infrastructure. Then as you like, yeah. as like people use the app, they're like, oh, I could use this infrastructure for this thing. And then you're like continually growing your customers. 100%, yeah. There's been many cases where someone was like, um, I want to build a telehealth marketplace. Uh, like, how does your components look like? And I say like, hey, please just sign up for a free account, use it for yourself and really get comfortable with the product. And if you like it, like call me back and like, let's start integrating. Because like, I think a lot of times when you have a, especially when there's a sales paywall in front of a developer focused product, you go yeah. through sales, you discuss pricing. And then after like a month, you get access to the actual product and you realize, oh fuck, this doesn't do what I want to do, <laughs> right? And, or it's, it's ugly as fuck or whatever. It's not working, it's slow or, yeah. or um, and so by having, as you said, this consumer facing product, you, you can just give it to them and, and, and they, and, and I always tell them like, pretend you're a doctor and click yourself through the product. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and also pretend you're your doctor, right? Like talk to your doctor and say like, Hey, is this something you would like to be using, mm -hmm. uh, in your day-to-day -day life? Um, and then it becomes a lot easier for them to get conviction to, you know, start using your API product. Okay. And uh, kind of branching off from that, like you talked about like Cal was like initially infrastructure, then you guys built the app. Do you think it's possible to move from like the other way around where like you built the app and then could you like also transition to like infrastructure or is that something that you say you wouldn't recommend? Well, that's what we did, right? We okay. we, we went from app yeah. to now infra, right? Yeah, yeah okay. That's, uh, that's possible either way. Well, I mean, we, 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 we had a two month window of like, let's do infra. We then mm -hmm. raised a uh, lot of VC funding, bought Cal.com and pretty much immediately went into consumer. Mm -hmm. uh, at least with version 1.0, we were mostly consumer facing. Um, 
but the yeah the idea was infra consumer infra pretty much but i mean we're doing both like we have a yeah. infra team and we have a consumer team they're both equally staffed we have mm. pretty equal revenue it's always it's always a priority to build both really uh, and uh i hope i have another question if that's okay so when you were like higher this is kind of like off a bit like higher i like, off but like when you were hiring what were you looking for when you're like staffing your infra tree in like especially early on because then like like I guess like when you guys first start like your baby or whatever, right? You want to make sure that you're like bringing on the best people. What were you looking for initially when you were hiring? Yeah. Uh, well, open source is great because I think we hired like uh, seven out of the first ten engineers were like contributors who yeah. built something before we we even reached out to them. Uh, mm -hmm. One of our lead engineers built our Stripe integration, uh, and another lead engineer built uh, around Robin, <laughs> right? Like these are really, yeah. really core products, and up to this day, they are kind of like managing those. Um, yeah. So, so that's that's just that's an uh, amazing experience you cannot get out of open, like outside of open source. And mm -hmm. if you think about like what's the most likelihood of success, it's having a good product and having a good team, really. Yeah. And with open source, you can build a fantastic team because it reduces your, your time to hire by a, a magnitude and but also the risk of hiring right like we've never had someone like leave cal.com i think only once where they ended up starting their own company so it's really hard to keep them anyway yeah. um and because because they contribute to the project without even thinking to apply Mm -hmm. but they are so like interested in what you're doing that they spend their weekend, their Sunday night, and instead of playing whatever hell divers they they write a line of code in your repo. So, I think these are people who are incredibly interested in in what you're doing um, versus, and they also have a job, <laughs> so they quit their job to join you typically, mm -hmm. um, and and that's that's what I've seen uh, in the past has been a great hiring funnel. Um, up until this day, we have a. We actually use Agora for bounties, right? Um, and so we have a, jo a jobs page, which uh, which says uh, we might we have no jobs open right now, but if you want to, you can do bounties and, and you know make money, <laughs> but also get on our radar and 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 yeah, yeah eventually do maybe an internship or we hire you. Mm -hmm. right, cool. For the team setup. Um, We've we've it's very controversial, but we've gotten really far with juniors only, um, mostly not for like saving money, but because I think um, when you think about complex or, or features or something, a lot of times um, when you've done it once, a it's not interesting anymore, and you don't want to do it again, or um, you think it it won't work because you've done it at another company and it didn't work. And so you're kind of like, ah, oh, no, I don't want to do it. A junior who is good, like you still need to, like there's good junior, bad junior, good senior, bad senior, like good mid, bad mid, right? Like that's, you know, you still want to have the best out of the best. Mm -hmm. um, but if you hire a good junior, they really don't know nothing about like, like what works and what doesn't. So they just do it the same way. I mean, I, I don't want to compare a junior engineer with Elon Musk, but like he had no idea of spaceships and everyone at NASA said like, you, you cannot land it, like fuck off. Right. And so yeah. he's like, but well, I don't know, let me try. And you really want to get this, um, a kind of like this, this positive inexperience in your team. Um, let them fuck up your code base really because like you, you're in the early stages you barely have any relevant customers uh, if you're down nobody cares like if you shoot down production nobody cares it's really just about like momentum and, and getting to market quickly um and uh and so juniors are great in the beginning we have a really strong senior engineering team now you know fixing all the shit that the juniors built two years ago um but I don't think it's ever worth optimizing the code base early on um, before product market fit really. Like it's just really getting out of out there. Um, yeah. Another famous like Notion is another example who really got far with junior engineers uh, up to a point where people were like, "This product is so fucking slow," and then they were like, "Okay, let's not make it slow anymore." Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and then uh, yeah, have a good split between junior and senior. Uh, so you know juniors can learn from the seniors and, and, you know, seniors can do code reviews and, and mentor them. Uh, another controversial take is do not hire any DevOps. 
I'm sorry, DevOps, if you're listening. Uh, it's really not worth your time. You should be focused on 100% building and fixing things, fixing bugs. Um, controversial take, Vercel is great. <laughs> like, it turns out you can go serverless quite far. I mean, we've done, I don't know, two or three million bookings by now. Uh, and it, it's, it's never more expensive than a single DevOp, to be honest. Um, mm -hmm. I think that's what people just need to realize eventually. Like, yeah, give me a $5 VPS. Sure. I don't want that. Like eventually maybe you can cut, cut some, uh, cut some costs. I don't know if you, but here's the thing, cutting costs when you have make like, I don't know, a couple of million in revenue and you save 20% of your baseline. Well, that's great. But like cutting costs when your total burn is like 500 bucks a month, don't give a shit. Like, just don't like take what's easy what's like low maintenance low effort like host it somewhere where you don't need to you know wake up in the middle of the night and reset your vps because something something broke um mm -hmm. just keep it somewhere where it works um ask them for a sponsorship if you're small they pr pretty much give you that if you have a spike because of hacker news they refund you like all of this blah blah i hear on on, on twitter and i'm not even a Vercel investor i should be though but like i i don't and same with netlify same with vendor like i think for getting started, it's the best way. Um, make a million first before you save on your server costs. Really, mm -hmm. um, sounds stupid, but it's, that's just the truth, really. Uh, mm -hmm. Cool. Nice. Um, I got a bounce in six minutes. Any burning questions? Anything we haven't covered? I have one more question. Uh, maybe it takes less than six minutes. Um, you talked about the app and infra model. So we're building an app first. Uh, we have enough funding to lasts a little bit less than a year. So our goal is to build a, a really good app before we start monetizing. So infra is our main like way to monetize, uh, but we have to raise money uh, at that point also. So uh, I don't know if traction in the form of free users, uh, of developers of like uh, GitHub stars and so on is, is interesting for for um, investors or not. So, so uh, you, you found a way for six minutes to raise three red flags. I'm sorry to say that. How much runway do we have? Like in months? Uh, eight to, to nine, around that. Uh, okay. Can you get that to like 13 or 14 with like cost cutting or revenue? Uh, really tough. It's already like at the minimum, I think it, it can be. Okay. You probably have to start raising immediately, at least build like relationships because fundraising, it's not 2021 anymore. Like fundraising takes longer, minimum three months longer than in the past, especially for a pre-revenue product. Um, so, and fundraising doesn't mean like you have a deck and you do all that stuff. It means finding who's interesting, like getting to know them, stay in touch, warm them up, keep them posted about your progress. Like people invest in lines, not dots. That's something I've learned from YC. Like, do not think you approach someone and they be like immediately invest into you. Like, um, and inbox is a great example. I don't know if Omar is still here, but uh, I've actually just invested in an inbox and I probably know him like seven months or eight months, maybe even a year by now. Um, and not because I didn't like him in the beginning, but you know, I, I, I invest my own money. I want to, you know, be comfortable that this is going somewhere. Um, so definitely start immediately if you're not already on it. Second thing, um, yeah, focus on revenue. Like I, I've never seen, unless you're Snapchat, like this holy grail of we're pre-revenue, but we're growing crazy fast. Like just fucking make revenue. You're not Snapchat. Um, and even Snapchat only got away with it by having like a couple million users. I don't think you have a couple million users. Um, so if you present a VC or even an angel investor with like 5,000 freemium users, I'm like, <sighs> Sorry, <laughs> that's not going to work. Um, so if your question is, should you postpone monetization? Absolutely not. <laughs> like, I mean, we, we've launched before. Again, we had monetization before we had products, really. Um, find a way to make at least somewhat of money. And even if it's a couple hundred bucks a month, you know, anything that gets you in, like, gets you runway, really, buys you time to build better reputation among angels or VCs. Um, you've raised the first round. When was that? Yeah, pre-seed uh, in December. Th this, uh, so uh, yeah. five months ago. Yeah. yeah, exactly. How much did you raise? Uh, 180K. 
180K. Okay, that's not too much. So you'd probably be able to raise another seed round at a good price. Uh, how much was, uh, pre if you if you mind sharing the yeah, uh, yeah, most money? Yeah, it was at uh, 1.63 million. Okay, yeah. And how much, what's the key metric right now? Is it users? You, you're not making money. So like what's the user growth has been? Like has it been like going up to uh, the right or are you more like flattening out? Like what's the... Yeah, none of them. We are still pre-product, so uh releasing like the first mvp in probably in a couple of weeks yeah hmm. <laughs> okay <So> um, <laughs> yeah yeah i mean uh, uh if i were you i would try to cut 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 costs immediately i don't know who that third engineer is you have on your team co-founders can try and survive off of ramen um, you said something about like in office, do not get an office like at all. Fuck that. Um, mm. I don't know if you really want to keep this alive, move probably in with your parents for six months and, and, and be a good son. Um, but I mean, pre-product, pre-revenue, and now trying to raise a follow-up round, you know, like what's the, what progress have you made since the last round? Like that's the burning question for any investor. Like, yeah. What have you done in the past? 12 months, you know, if six months go by, like what have you done in the past six months, 12 months? Yeah, yeah, that's the that's the main question, yeah. We what have be... you done? What have you done yeah. in the last six months? I mean, we've been, we've been working on the on the products, honestly. We, we, we went through a couple iterations mm -hmm. uh, of stuff that didn't work. But yeah, hopefully by by next week, I have an answer to this question, but yeah, for now, not <laughs> yeah. Um, Another, another, you know, um, thing is also to apply for accelerators uh, because I don't want to be rude to YC or tech, tech stars, but they, they don't really care about product. Like they care about the founder vibe. Um, and so, if you do not have a product today, it's probably also a good idea to to go those routes. Because, um, like, if you if you have a, a strong vision of like where the future is, and you you present mm -hmm. as a good founder, and you, you you're out here to build something meaningful that can be enough. It's not enough for a traditional VC because VC is typically post YC, you know? Yeah. Um, angels, I would also like angels you don't know is probably, are probably also very turned off by pre-product, pre-revenue, especially if it's the second round. Um, but if you know angels who you've worked with before, you know, yeah. who trust you as a person and don't care about the product, like if we were best friends, yeah, sure, I'm, I'm going to cut you a check and I'm trying to get more people on board. But yeah, if, if we barely met and we don't know you, then it's going to be really, really tough. Yeah, we have one angel investor that you probably know. I, I'm not sure if I should mention, but uh, yeah, maybe that route like it could, could give us uh, more yeah. introductions. Yeah. yeah. But again, really, really focus on getting something out. Uh, I mean, I had to be very clear to Omar, like, like fucking just launch. Like you're already way beyond the point of launching when it comes to a feature set. Um, yeah. And it only gets easy after that. Like you have a community, you have users, they tell you what to build, you just listen to them and you build it better than what they imagine and, and you're off to the races. Yeah. Top. Thanks. So, cool. All right. That's a good uh, wrapping up. I really hope you make it. Please ping me uh, if not. and. But also remember, um, if you raised 180K, that's like not a lot of funding to be burning. Uh, best advice I've gotten from, from an existing investor, it was actually like, peer, shut this company down. It's not going to work. And just let me invest in the next one. Right? So um, it's not the end of the world. So, but but we, we don't tell them. your investors I said that. <laughs> All right. Thanks a lot. Right. Yeah, thank cool. you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye. Coolio, that was fun. Take care, everyone. Bye.